Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the After Party, Season 2, Episode 2, Grace. In this episode, we get to see Zoe's sister's POV of the evening, find out what it is that she loved and didn't love about the marriage that she was entering into, and also we get a whole new genre of POV, which is very fun. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Max for commissioning this episode. I really, really enjoyed this one, you guys. And I will tell you what, I felt like such a dodo bird. I saw... <laughs> this. I, I'm going to really sound like a stupid idiot, but it's fine. I saw the thumbnail for the next episode last time and I saw that it looked like a like Regency you know a period piece had completely forgotten about the conceit of each POV being a particular genre and was like oh that's weird it must just be like the camera angle capturing a certain look and making it seem that like I'm interpreting it this way because I've been watching Gilded Age and stuff lately I just straight up forgot that the genre thing is a thing because like Anik's perspective as he's telling is, I, I know that it's meant to be like romantic comedy, but it didn't feel super romantic comedy, like over the top this time to me, it felt like pretty grounded, still comedic, but not as uh not as romantic actually and so i think that i just sort of lost track of the fact that this is how the the story gets told i really felt like a ding dog guys i'm sorry <laughs> um but yeah so the the whole way that this like this is something that i was thinking about last time and i think i sort of mentioned but just the fact that I was pretty sure Zoe was going to take exception to the fact that Anik mentioned seeing her put poison and stuff and that there was going to be a kind of like, I can't believe that you would betray me sense to things. And that does sort of come up this episode. She, what she says, and forgive me guys, I'm all like stuffy because I was just crying because I was saying happy birthday to Rashawn. Um, but what I think is going on here is like he, she says to him, well, you brought Danner in to make sure Grace doesn't get convicted of this murder, right? Like we're on the same page. He says yes. And Pinky swears that they're on the same page. And I really wanted him. And I know why he didn't. And I really get it. But I really wanted him to be like, I mean, I brought her here to find the murderer. And that's exactly what Danner says later, which I really appreciated. She like basically took the words and tone right out of my mouth of like, no, I I'm not here to find the findings you want me to find. I am here to find out what happened and maybe you won't like it. But that's what I'm going to do. That's the actual job I'm here for. Not just like, you know, making things go the way that you need them to go. So I think Grace's POV, like, I do not at this point believe that she's the murderer. I was saying last episode that I kind of hoped it was her. And there's still a little bit part of me that like does hope. But it feels just the, the so much more, uh, what's the word I want, orchestrated. The fact that she didn't sign the prenup 
it feels like the kind of conniving that she doesn't seem to be. And it could turn out that she's a very different person than she seems. But that would also require Zoe to really not have the measure of her own sister. And I'm not saying that siblings can't be wrong about each other. But that tends to happen when people sort of like fall out of touch or they have a real like like unrealistic understanding of one another, whether it's biased because of like, you know, old hurts and traumas or jealousies. And I feel like Zoe and her, they have their sibling issues, but they do seem pretty close. So I'm willing to trust that Zoe's estimation of her as like a sweet romantic is actually true. And that it's not just the fact that I'm seeing her that way because she's playing a bit of a role and you know it, you guys I'm just gonna mention this because it's on my mind by the time this comes out I'm sure that this whole thing is gonna have died down to a point that maybe you won't even remember what I'm talking about if you're listening to this like a year later but the past couple days there has been a drop of TikToks by a user named Risa Tisa R-E-E-S-A, T-E-E-S-A. And it's a 50-part series that she posted on her TikTok. They're 10 minutes each. So yes, we're talking eight hours. It's like an audiobook to go through them. Describing a scenario in which she basically got conned. And the person who conned her, she married and she didn't find out until shortly after the marriage exactly what was going on. And even now is like, there's probably even more to it that I never found out. But this person did a really solid job of playing a role and offering just enough like explanation and excuse to a person they knew was going to be looking for reasons to excuse that behavior so that they would believe it. And the whole way that this goes, I'm not going to get into. But it's got me really thinking about the types of people that pretend to be someone else. And pretending to be somebody else, I have tried this the way that many people do when they're younger, just putting different hats on and trying to figure out what feels right. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of energy. It takes either a certain kind of like sustained energy or a complete lack of interest in really deceiving so that you like, you don't mind that you get caught in lies because it doesn't bother you because you have kind of contempt for the people that you're trying to fool anyway. And I just don't really get that impression off of grace. I just think that she, what you see is what you get with her. Um, so, yeah, we <laughs> when everything starts off for this episode, you know, b before we actually get straight into the the POV itself, we have to establish who we're talking to first, explain like the mind movie thing um, with Danner. And she zeroes in on Grace naturally because of seeing her put something in Edgar's drink and the fact that she is here, people are questioning because first they said no cops and she comes across as a cop. But then when they explain that she's not, it's almost like, well, then what the fuck do we need to listen to you for? And yet I think it like Edgar's mother seems like she is trying to, I think, like, use this woman to to assist so that maybe they can avoid getting the cops involved entirely until like you know the 11th hour um but yeah so she uh is is interviewing everybody separately as she had done before and immediately when she starts talking to grace Zoe comes in and just is like, oh, uh, I know that Grace was a little cold, 
uh, or runs a little cold. So I just wanted to drop this off. And then as she's handing it off, she's like, uh, I guess I'll just leave this here. And at first I thought it was going to turn out that she like had hidden her, her phone on record in the folds of the, the sweater. But then she just straight up says, unless you want me to stay. And Grace says, I think you want to stay. And she just says, I do actually, it's okay. Right. If I stay. So Danner at this point is like looking at Anique and eventually she winds up just kicking Zoe out, but it takes a little while. I really enjoy how Zoe, like the actress handles Grace speaking because she keeps chiming in in a way that feels very infantilizing. And I definitely understand because Grace feels extremely immature in a lot of ways. I understand the, the intent to sort of clarify what she's saying, but Zoe, she's a grown ass woman and you need to stop. You just need to stop, you know? Um, she says something about how I had just broken up with this guy who he stole my underwear and Anique chimes in Travis. It was Travis. Right. And she says, surprisingly, not actually, but we don't hear who it is though. And I am really curious. I don't know if that's, this matters ultimately, but the fact that it's not said who it is, I'm just sort of like, is it going to turn out to be somebody who was at this event? Like the angry waiter, you know, like who was it? What the fuck? Um, and this is when, again, Zoe chimes in. Yeah, so Grace has always been unlucky in love. And Grace says, no, I love being in love. I just never found the right person until I met Edgar. And she says, he's just my type. Boyishly handsome, a little odd. And this is when we go into the you know, whole Regency setting, the wigs, the gowns and whatnot. Um, And it's funny because like, obviously this has to be done on a little bit of a budget. And also they're not trying that hard to like really get the look. It's just like more of the impression of the look in a lot of ways Um, so that you know what we're doing, but we don't, we're, we're not investing everything in this, you know? And we find out the way that she met Edgar was she has like an antiques booth inside of this, like, it's sort of like an indoor flea market type of setting. Um, and he was looking for a vintage typewriter, which uh, he shows up here knowing that she has it already. So I don't know if she, you know, she posts things on Facebook and he followed it up because of that or what. But yeah, she initially screams very loudly when she sees him because of the lizard, which felt unwarranted to me but i'm not you know like maybe it's maybe she's afraid of lizards or well i don't think so based on her her behavior later but uh but anyway yeah and so she's like joking around with him about maybe this is for your lizard and he's like no i don't think she would use a typewriter and she says because she prefers calligraphy and gives him this little like saucy little and he seems delighted when she when when he realizes that she's joking i am really disappointed i'm gonna say it again first of all that edward is dead but also that we're not gonna get his pov because i am really curious if what it looks like is what it is the role that she has cast herself in in this you know is like very much a manic pixie dream girl type and i know that's a sort of overused phrase but it can be very useful because like all it means really when it comes down to it is she is coming in to shake up his world and to be the uh, the quirky, free-spirited type in his buttoned-up, staid world. And there's just frequent 
moments of people saying, I've never seen him like this before, or I've never met anyone like you before. And I always like, there was a long period of my life where I sort of aimed to be this type, the surprising type, unlike anybody, you know? And the thing is like, you can pull that off if people don't get to know you that well, but that's, that's really a part best played for acquaintances. It's not good for foundations of relationships. And like I, I'm saying, I was attempting to do this like in a very conscious way. I'm not saying that about grace. My approach was kind of cynical, honestly. And I don't, I think she's genuinely like this, but I just noticed the way that she put herself in this role. If she is somebody who is into romance, then the kinds of romance that are fed to women often are this exact sort of, of storytelling. The role of the woman is to open the man's world up and change him fundamentally from a person who didn't know how to have fun, didn't know how to open themselves up and be vulnerable to learning from the woman they're in love with how to be more, you know, and her, like, the way she talks about being in love is really, really telling. And uh, also something that I relate to a lot. I have talked a lot about feeling like there's a, a high likelihood that I am on the spectrum somewhere. I'm definitely neurodivergent, but as I have gotten older, I have realized how much media has influenced my behavior and my expectations of things. And that I have modeled a lot of my behavior throughout my life on what I have been shown and what has been like demonstrated as uh, ideal from women. And it has really profoundly impacted how I move through the world in a way that I believe it does for a lot of people, but not in the same way that it seemed for me, where it was really like a blueprint for me. And one of the, the most damaging things about that kind of media outlining what you expect of the world and what you, what standard you hold yourself to is not only your physical appearance, which the damage there is profound, but also your standards for relationships and what you expect from them. And I am turning 40 this year. At my big age, I'm only really just grasping how much I was fed a bill of goods about what really romantic relationships are the realism of them, not like the, the reality of them, not the, the fantasy of them. And what I can expect from my partner in terms of change, because the stories always are about somebody changing. And in real life, the change isn't necessarily a change you want or a change you have control over or can assist with, or that is, you know what I mean? People change inevitably over time, but sometimes you change to people that you don't like, you don't like one another very much anymore, or they change more rapidly than you and sort of outgrow you or vice versa. And what the impression I get from Grace is that what Zoe says about her loving being in love and loving the concept of Edgar more than him as a person, it does ring a little true to me. I also really appreciated getting to see the moment where she says, I don't think you should marry him. I was reading it when she described it to Anique in the last episode as that Zoe offered up this information. She volunteered it, cornered her sister, whatever. And her sister's own admission is that she demanded that Zoe tell her how she felt. She cornered her actually. And Zoe was like, cares enough and worries enough about her sister's happiness to tell the truth when maybe some people would just still have kept their mouth shut. But it was just, I was glad to know at least that Zoe didn't just like burst into the room and be like, you can't do this. Um, so the, the concept of like, 
the way that she is swept off her feet by Edgar, it's a really interesting thing to watch because, you know, when you, you imagine somebody like him and you're talking about a woman being swept off her feet, my instinct and what I expect is a sort of love bombing situation, which for those who aren't familiar with this term is a tactic used by abusive people to sort of uh, get somebody's defenses down by sweeping them off their feet with these huge gestures and this overload of attention that makes the person feel at the time like they are very important, like they matter, like they are an unusual find, like the person is feeling really lucky to have met them. And what it is actually about is that person trying to sort of corner and isolate you from other people by going in really hard and setting up this, this like persona of being a really romantic top tier boyfriend or girlfriend so that when they are, they have you in the palm of their hand where they want you, and they begin to sort of close you off from things. They can say, but I love you. I'm doing this because I love you and point to all of the behaviors at the start of things that were very dramatic, illustrating, see how clearly I love you because I've done all of these things and sort of like use that against you, use it as evidence that they are a good person. And it's something that is so unfortunate because so many of us have been taught that those sorts of gestures are a sign that somebody does care and does love you. The term love bombing has only really become popularized in the past like five or 10 years. And before that, we would have genuinely seen this sort of thing as highly romantic. It's, it's taken so long for us to understand what it can turn into and the kind of control that it usually signals about the person. And I think that a lot of us who are sort of terminally online, we have grown to see that, but people who aren't educated about these sorts of things still do take it as being this like really desirable thing. When somebody comes through like that, it means something good about them instead of it being a red flag, which is how I tend to view it now. So that's what I was expecting. But Edgar isn't doing that, actually. He is doing these gestures, but he seems very, like, just unaware of what it is that Grace really wants. It seems like he it doesn't occur to him that she simply wants to spend time with him. He seems to think that if he like gives her certain things, that will be a demonstration of how much he cares about her, that the effort he puts into like finding her uncle, the meaning behind that and how much he cares for her. I'm not saying that's not what it means, but she says, I would rather have spent that time together and so it's obvious, like her priority, as much as she loves her uncle, finding out that he was looking for her uncle during the first, the two weeks before their wedding, he thinks that this is a romantic gesture and she's a little disappointed by it. And they just have very different priorities. And that's not to say that they couldn't make this work between the two of them. I think they're the kind of people that if they were able to like, have a, a sit down with a third party, like a counseling session, and they explained this, it would be very clear very quickly that for her, time spent together is what means the most to her. And for him, he's giving her a gift of her uncle. It's not a material thing, so it feels slightly less superficial, but it is still, he was putting an effort doing something that he thought was really important to her, but turned out to not really be as much as he thought that there was something else she would have liked better. And perhaps on his end as well, there have been things that she has wanted that he didn't 
like, or that he has wanted that she was not doing or caring about. And the, the overall relationship between the two of them, we see this sort of whirlwind courtship. She didn't know how much money he had or the position that he occupied in the world. He was apparently on like the, you know, top 10 most eligible bachelors of Silicon Valley in, I don't remember what it was, like Forbes or something. She didn't even know that. She comes to this event unprepared for like the level of glamour for this birthday party and begins to realize, wait, whoa, this is a much bigger deal than I thought. And I don't care who you are. If you don't come from a lot of money and you find out that a person has a lot, it is really, really hard not to let that influence how you feel about them. I am not saying that she is a gold digger. I am saying that we live in a world where money matters more than anything. And it's an unfortunate fact. It ma like, and, and when I say more than anything, I don't mean in terms of like personal happiness, although that is a factor much larger than a lot of people want to admit, but money can solve most problems that people have. If you've got medical issues, if you've got debt, if you've got family that's struggling, if you've like name a problem and I will find a way for money to either solve it entirely or make it that much easier. And there is a feeling of, of relief to knowing that somebody you're with could help you or protect you, keep you safe from the anxieties that of not having, you know? So I'm not saying again that she was with him for his money, but I am also not saying that the money wasn't a factor <laughs> because of course it is this glamorous life that he is throwing at her. It doesn't include him as much as she wants it to. She genuinely likes him. And that's what's sort of interesting is like, Instead of being wowed by the things he's doing for her to the point where she ignores the, like, that she ignores things about him that she doesn't like, she is actually wishing that the things he did for her led to them spending more time together because she does like him. When she's around him, she enjoys him. She finds him really endearing. But they just never get enough of that time together. And we see how often their dates are interrupted. Like literally they're having a picnic and a helicopter lands to pick him up. Like he is taken away all the time. I am so deeply curious why the fuck he needs to immediately leave at any given moment. Like, what is that about? And we find out like the thing with his watch, it's a weird thing because the watch issue when he is in the dance with her, the first dance is not the same thing as the watch issue that goes as a through line through this episode. But what he tells her at first is like, he is basically experimenting with like a way of living that is supposed to extend his lifespan to 140 years. Again, with the difference in their priorities, he could live a regular number of years as long as he got to spend that time with her and she would be happy with that. But for him, it's the quantity over the quality that really seems to matter. And it's sort of funny because he's like, I want it to be a long life with you, but he's not seeming to try and convince her to live this lifestyle. So she's just going to have a regular length life and he's going to outlive her according to the metrics we're going by right now. But that doesn't seem to bother him and he doesn't factor that in, which seems strange. But um, that is why he like leaves to go to bed at this exact time every night. He has this very strict routine, which also lines up with being on the spectrum. Like there are people who the routine is a comfort and it is something that keeps them steady and they feel really unsafe without it. So while there may be this ultimate goal that he's working towards, it may also just be the comfort of the routine itself and not the goal that's really keeping him engaged with it. But she obviously like him going to bed at nine 30 
every night has led to a crimp in their style because apparently Zoe says that Grace is a night owl and there have been events and stuff where he has just like gone to gone home really early in the middle of things and indeed he wants to like end their wedding party their their reception early because he's going to bed and she is so disappointed by it and i really think that if she said if she were more direct i wonder if it would like have kept him awake what she does about their first dance for example when she is spoken with by the uh best man i can't remember his name sebastian i think he sort of like walks around her and whispers to her about how this uh this first dance is something that like is a sacred ritual and that if she wants it she should just demand it and it really makes me think that he is attempting to get Edgar out of the way so that he can do something. And the fact that there is an alert on his wrist about his lizard leads me to believe Sebastian was doing something to the lizard that he didn't realize that Edgar could get notifications for on his wristwatch or he did know and was trying to lure him away. Maybe he is trying to drive a wedge between the two of them. I don't know. But when she asks Edgar to dance, like to do the first dance, at first he's like, that would make me uncomfortable. But then when she's, he asks, but it would be really important to you. And she says, yes, he fully does an about face and is like, okay, then I will do it. And he is willing, even though it makes him uncomfortable, if she emphasizes how much it matters to her, he is willing to do it. So I can't help but be like, if you know, he goes to bed at 930 every night. Have a conversation with him about how I know that you usually have this routine, but I need you to agree with me that our wedding night has to be an exception. This is a, a major event. It means a lot to me. It is highly symbolic. And I, ex I have an expectation of how this is going to go. And I don't expect you to make an exception often, but our, our wedding night is like, just has to be one of them. And I think if she had approached it this way, it would have probably worked out. But the thing is, she is so romantic that she doesn't want to have to say these things. She wants him to be somebody who cares about her so much that he knows, of course, I'm going to make an exception. It's our wedding night. Of course, I'm not going to bed at 930. She expects him to anticipate these things because they're important to her but they don't really know each other well enough for him to understand that and even if they did he isn't that personality type he's clearly very literal he needs to be told things in words in a really blunt direct fashion he doesn't like I'm not saying he doesn't pick up on subtlety because he clearly understands the subtlety of certain situations and the subtext of them and stuff. And he will just say them out loud. He doesn't care about the tact of it, but he understands what's happening. But I think that his understanding is I can understand that you want a certain thing, but unless you actually say it to me, it must not matter that much to you. So I'm going to go ahead and do my thing unless I am explicitly told otherwise. So on the night of their wedding, she has to ask him to stay up. And he, she tells him, remember that time on New Year's when you had an Adderall to stay awake and we had such an amazing night. And really, really notably, she's saying we had such an amazing night. But he says, I was up until 5 a.m. playing checkers against myself because I couldn't sleep. He didn't think it was an amazing night. He didn't love it. She saw it as this like magical, you know. So this is when you start to be like, maybe Zoe was right about their compatibility. I think that more communication probably could make some of this work. 
But the fact that he says how uncomfortable he was and she doesn't really seem to hear him or fully understand it or care that has got a lot of red flags in it for me. Um, so anyway, this, we also find out that, uh, she, the sister is adopted. Um, let's see Edgar's sister. Oh yeah. They both say adopted very quickly. Um, and she gets quite close to her and it turns out when Edgar gets like called away for business, the two of them wind up spending a lot of time together. And, uh, I was really wondering, could it be her? I like her. I don't want it to be her because she seems really funny and sweet, but, uh, I, I am sort of trying to imagine what the, motivation could be and i also am very curious whether whoever killed edgar was aware grace hadn't signed the prenup before he died because it would be a real bummer if you thought he she had signed it and come to find out she hadn't and now your plans are screwed um woman's name is hannah okay got that so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping around here guys a lot, but I just, I just found this really interesting. They have like, it's really cute because of this, the genre that they're working in. She's like naming popular dances, modern dances, but using this antiquated language. So she's like, instead of teaching me how to Dougie, she's saying, maybe I could teach you how to Douglas. And is this, what about we could dance soldier boy, but she calls it the boy soldier. Um, I did think that was pretty fun. Uh, what's, what's the first one that she says? Oh, uh, she says the unwed lady and she does the single ladies like hand. I thought that was pretty cute. I really do enjoy how it's like this, uh, period clothing, period modes of speech, but they still drop modern slang. They still have fucking helicopters and stuff like there. We're not trying to we're making this genre, but like, you know, not over the top type that she's living in like a fantasy land. Um, so (laughs) I'm trying to see, oh yeah, this, and, and it's really emphasized that Sebastian is sort of hovering in the background all the time. He is claiming to approve of her in words, but his actions do not seem to show that. And he feels sinister and threatening when he's around her, it gives the impression that she does not like him. She does not come out and say that. And there's nothing specific that he does. He's just got a vibe. Um, there's also the matter of, uh, Isabel, Edgar's mother, who really is awful. (laughs) She, first of all, keeps getting grace's name wrong and calling her gail and doing it if she like actually says at one point to edgar it seems like someone of her station would be named gail which is just absolutely devastating <laughs> my god but then later on their wedding napkins she puts the name gail on the wedding napkins that she ordered. Now I'm going to, I'm going to hazard something here, guys. And this is again, like a complete fabrication. All of my theories and my assumptions about these people, whenever I, you know, I'll just sort of go with my gut instinct at the, I think it's the rehearsal dinner where they find out that the, the napkins have the name Gail on them. She seems actually embarrassed. Isabel does at the fact that she got the name wrong. She's trying to pretend, in my opinion, that it doesn't matter. Trying to play it off like her mistake isn't that big a deal. I actually don't think she did this to be malicious. I think she is a fucking mess and really made a genuine mistake. And I may be giving her way more credit than she's due. But... I mean, the first episode, there's a moment where Edgar says, my mom 
would come out to meet you, but she's busy with darkness and alcohol, which what a line. I can't decide if Isabel is just straight up an alcoholic, if she's an alcoholic and drug user, like she takes it an Adderall. So I have to assume that's part of the thing. Or I don't know, like, is, is she being sabotaged a little bit because, to make her look like more of a disaster than she really is? I don't know why one would do that. She's pretty terrible just face to face verbally. I don't know how much worse you have to make it. But uh, I just felt like there was something about her attitude with these napkins that was more defensive than somebody who really doesn't give a shit would be like, you know what I'm saying? Um, and yeah, she has a real like bug up her ass about the fact that Grace doesn't, hasn't got the prenup signed when she's getting ready for the wedding. Um, so we have also like the planning of the wedding and at first, oh my God, you guys, I forgot about, I think, uh, <laughs> I think it's, his name is Feng eating potpourri. <laughs> out of the bowl and just like when she points out it's potpourri it's air freshener he just keeps saying like bon appetit yummy and eating it and i was just like sir i don't know if i should trust any food you have a hand in making if you're just like gonna chow down on some potpourri and be like this is great i don't know about that um i love the fact that when her mom brings up reusing the centerpieces from the rehearsal dinner for the reception isabel says wonderful why don't we just reuse the wine as well we can walk around spitting it into each other's mouths oh my god i just she promptly is like we'll pay for everything it's totally fine we'll handle it all don't worry about that that's just clearly not an issue um but yeah this is when she suggests, Grace suggests, Hannah do the flower arrangements. And Hannah looks actually a little startled and says, I would be honored. But there's, I don't know, there's something about the way that she reacts. I got my eye on you, Hannah. I just do. I have my eye on you. I like you. I think you're weird and I enjoy that. But the way she like glances down at her teacup and gets sort of weird and the fact that they're both so insistent on mentioning that she's adopted, there's something up and I don't know what that is. Something's up. She just has a, a vibe to her. Um, so yeah, this is when Grace says, I have always envisioned my, uh, my wedding is a more intimate affair with family contributions. And again, this is when she says, don't worry, we'll pay for everything as usual. Like, it seems like she thinks what Grace is saying is I want to keep it small simply because of the budget. But her mother like steps in and clarifies, it's not just that, it's the wedding day. And Grace says, and it will be wonderful because the people I love will be there. And just is sort of reassuring her mother, it's fine. You know, maybe it won't be exactly what I pictured, but that's the thing that she wants and she's paying for it. So we'll go ahead and do that. I just want to make sure that my father's bao bing is what we eat for dessert. Now, I'm going to go ahead and call it. I think his bao bing was poisoned specifically. I have no idea if he even ate any guys. I'm just straight up throwing it out there because this like ice has been such a uh, subject that it has to be integral to the murder itself. So that's what I'm calling is that it's, it's that which was poisoned. Um, so then we have like the bachelorette party and Zoe being like, I'm really happy with you for, for you. And I was worried that you wouldn't find anybody. And she says, I knew Edgar would be different the moment he whisked me off to Amsterdam for lunch. And all of the girls are just like, that is so sweet. But then she says his business meeting ran late, so I didn't actually see him there. 
And Zoe's like, wait, what? And she's like, no, but I got to Tori Amsterdam and it was really, really beautiful. And then when I got home, Edgar made up for it completely by taking me to a private business dinner on his yacht. And it's like, on his yacht sounds good, but saying private business dinner, that doesn't feel like anything. That's not, is that anything? And it turns out that's not the issue for Zoe. She chimes in with, but you loathe boats. You get dreadfully seasick. And she says, well, yes, I was in bed for days, but Edgar sent his personal chef to make me soup. And again, the girls are starting to react and Zoe interrupts with, he didn't bring the soup himself. Well, no, because he was closing a very lucrative cryptocurrency deal and it's consuming a lot of his time. But no matter, once we're married, everything will be rosy. At which point Zoe literally laughs in her face. And it's like, do you really think that's going to solve your problems, getting married? And she gets very defensive and says, I must demand that you stop projecting your unfortunate marriage to that oaf Brett on my own. I was doing no such thing. You tell us of a whirlwind courtship, and yet there is no suitor. And she says, why must you be so cruel? Which I... That's not cruel, girl. That's just telling you back what you just said to them in different words. You don't want those words. That's clear. But she's not saying anything that you didn't first say. And she replies, because you are so in love with the idea of being in love that you cannot see that Edgar does not make you happy. Do you really love him at all? Or has his station blinded you? And Zoe, it comes back to the present. And she's like, that is not what I said. I asked if you were actually happy or if you just felt like you should be happy. And rightfully, Grace says that's a really shitty thing to ask somebody at their bachelorette party. Yeah. She's not wrong. You know, like... I said before last episode, if you have these sorts of concerns, I think that's valid. If you're close enough to the person and you feel like they can take hearing from you, that's valid. But you don't do it at a wedding related event. You do that on your own time long before you get to this point. It's just, you know, if Grace hadn't if, or if Zoe hadn't seen the experiences that Grace was having earlier Maybe she wasn't close enough and isn't close enough to make this call here in the first place. But this is just, this is not the time to do it. And Grace says, I know that you worry about me, but you have to stop and let me make my own choices. And Zoe says, I did. And look how that turned out. And at that point, Danvers is like, okay, yeah. You're going to have to go. Dan or not Danvers. Sorry, I'm getting her confused with True Detective. Um, I think it looks like Zoe realizes that was a fucked up thing to say. Like, I, I she gets a look of shame on her. Because, like, she's basically implying your judgment was pet, so now he's dead. Like, that's, what do you even mean, you know? But in the hall, she's, like, arguing with Anique. Danner comes out and is just like, you are not going to stay there. And she says, I'm not going anywhere. And Anique doesn't know whose side to take here. The way that Danner decides to play this is very tactful, where she's like, maybe we can give her something else to do. And so they come up with the idea of her gathering evidence. She is well aware that this is being used to dismiss her. But she's like, all right, fine. You know what? You think you're just giving me something to distract me, but I'm, I'm going to do it, actually. I'm going to do an amazing job. And you're going to realize that you're fucking idiots for pushing me out of the room. And honestly, Zoe, there is no need for you to be there in that room while she's talking. Like, you just think that you need to be there because you are controlling. And you want to clarify everything she says because you don't trust her point of view. And honestly, that's not your job. And there's no reason we should trust your point of view more than hers in general. You're both going to be biased in your own ways and they'll get 
uh, you know, information from you later with your POV, maybe. I don't know if we're going to get hers or not. Um, so anyway, uh, we go back to the, uh, the, you know, questioning, but, and back into the bachelorette. And she says, Hannah was there to comfort me asking, do you weep because your sister's right or because she's wrong? And I really appreciated it being asked that way. That's a really just, it's a good question. And she admits that she doesn't know. He has been really busy. I know that he wants to be with me. But, you know, what do I want? She isn't even really sure how to answer that question. And she says, I had plenty of time to think about it because I didn't see Edgar again until the weekend of the wedding. And she's like in her outfit. It's not her wedding dress. I think she is in her uh, like the rehearsal dinner outfit. And he comes to find her. And it turns out that the box that they use at their um, ceremony is not his idea. It turns out she is concerned about the wedding being about everybody else. And he agrees that the guests are the worst part. And she says, I really want our wedding to be about the two of us. You know, that's, you know, I, I, I want it to feel like it does when we are alone together. I promise it'll be about the two of us. Um, and then he says, oh, and I have something for you. And he pulls out the prenup, which again, opposite of the vibe. And she straight up says that. And is like, can I sign this on Monday? And he agrees because he doesn't think anything could possibly happen. But it looks really bad. Dana writes down, refused to sign prenup. And she takes some exception to it being phrased that way. But she's like, I really didn't want this whole song and dance. Like the rehearsal dinner? What is this even for? I hated all of this stuff. And she says something about how Isabel had gotten even worse. We get the uh, the thing with the napkins and whatnot. And I can't help again, but feel like, I don't know, Isabel, there's just something about, she seems sad in this moment, like truly sad, you know, I don't know. Um, a fortnight ago, she had a, what is it that he says? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Um, a fortnight ago, she had a five hour energy at a 7-Eleven and has not been the same since. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, but poor Grace. She looks up and this is when Travis comes in and he's got this shit eating grin and there's a real energy to him that he believes she called him here for like one last tryst before the wedding night or something. He is all over her and it is very uncomfortable. He gives her all these knowing looks. The whole thing is just, you know, whatever. And then we jump to him and Zoe and she's going into the room where Edgar's body is and he wants to accompany her, but it isn't until they're inside in the presence of the body that it becomes very clear he does not want to be around a dead body. Like, he can't handle this. She's looking through his pockets for stuff, needing his help, turning him over. They find his phone, and she closed his eyes because his open eyes were freaking Travis out. But then they realize they need his eyes open if we're going to activate the, uh, the, what do you call it, face recognition on his phone to unlock it. Which ends up with them in a very weird position that they get walked in on with Anik and Danner where she's like behind him, holding him up and Travis is like straddling Edgar. The whole thing is just so strange. Um, but in his pocket, sorry, I'm trying to find the, oh my God, I forgot about the hairpin thing. Isabel is insisting on it. It's a hairpin that every Danner has worn on their wedding day since the Civil War. I expect you to wear it. Zoe straight up says it's hideous. She says it's priceless. 
And Grace snatches it up and says, I'll wear it. I wonder if this has anything to do with anything. Because, you know, this is just like in A Song of Ice and Fire, the hair net on the wedding night is a thing. We find out later. That actually is super important. I have no idea if this is just like just a hairpin or what. Um, but yeah, this is when she notices that the prenup isn't signed. And then she gets distracted by the Adderall and is like, ooh, can I have one of these? Um, so yeah, this is the conversation between her and Zoe where Zoe says, I just feel like you are changing your life around for him and he is not changing his life around for you at all. And again, in terms of what women are taught, that is a full on expectation of us. And once you get to understand the grift about marriage and how we're played, it's like, well, women want to get married and men don't want to get married, but you begin to get older and realize that men actually all want marriage because they get the best deal out of it. They get somebody to have sex with and somebody who is expected to clean up and take care of their children so they don't have to. And that is just part of the deal. Like traditionally, there is no reason why men shouldn't want to get married. Except that now I can't have sex with other women, which frankly, they probably weren't anyway. But a lot of women are taught their own lives are expected to be backburnered their own interests and hobbies for the man. And it's always treated as temporary initially. I'll begin to do my things again once we're settled. And that's always like the danger word because it doesn't have any real meaning. And then once she starts to try and pick up her old hobbies again, guess what? Husband's perplexed because, well, I thought you just stopped doing that. Why are you doing that again? I thought we agreed that we were going to do this other thing that I like, you know, it's just like, she's just, she is making some errors that I have also made. That's all I'm saying. Um, but yeah, I want so much more than that for you is what she says to her. And on the wedding day, when they're like, doing their vows to each other. She almost looks like she's going to cry. She's so uncertain about everything. And at first he starts to recite his vows, like reading off of a paper and she stops him, takes the papers away and says, when we first met, you told me that I brought things out of you, but I don't know that I actually have. I would love to, but tell me how you actually feel from your heart. And he says, I know I do things a certain way. I know that I'm strange, but I thought I would spend my dotage with puzzles as my only company. Now you're the only puzzle I want to solve. You make me want to change. And she says, I don't know if it was exactly what I wanted to hear, but for Edgar, it was goddamn Shakespeare. And I really, I believe him. But is it enough? You know, like, is it? Ah, they, they just got married too fast. That's really what it comes down to. They just did it too fast. Um... So anyway, then comes the uh, first dance and they're actually like having a pretty good time when he gets like this message on his, uh, his Apple watch and gets called away and she is standing there embarrassed and devastated and everybody, it's just like this really awful moment. You guys, if you were in this tent with them and saw this happen you would just hate this guy you just would like what this is unthinkable but what pops up on his watch is like bright red and it's almost like did did his lizard just die did something happen to her it felt like and i'm not saying that that's a good enough reason to stop the whole thing 
But whatever it was, it was definitely an emergency. And I almost wonder if like, if he had said, oh my God, Roxana, this means that she, her heart is like stopping. If he can uh, communicate it to her, what this meant, in other words, maybe she would have understood because Roxana is like his security animal. You know, maybe she would have gotten why he made this such a priority in the moment. But in at this point, just leaving like that, just awful. Um, so anyway, she finds looking through his pockets, she finds a lip balm. Um, really? A lip balm? What's in it? That got my attention. Lip balm is one of the easiest things to make from scratch at home. Like, you just need, like, certain oils and mix them together and pour them into a little dispenser and that's it. Boom. And if we've got somebody who's got fucking psychotropic plants in there and who knows chemistry and maybe was aware that somebody was probably going to dose him with some Adderall. Maybe they knew that things were going to happen a certain way. Cause like Grace's explanation for doing the Adderall thing is he would had it before and it hadn't hurt him. And I'm sort of thinking it might've been a combo. Maybe it was something else that he had with it. That was the problem. You know, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, and he has a cuff link, but only one of them, despite the fact that he is already wearing cuff links. So I don't know why he had these two cuff links where the one of them went. No idea. Uh, and the reason that they're trying to open his phone is that the watch tracks heart rate. And they're thinking that if they get into his health app, they can find out time of death because it will show when his heart stopped, but they don't succeed in doing that by the end of the episode. Uh, so yeah, this is when she begs him to stay awake and she tries to get him to take an Adderall, but he doesn't want to do it. And then she's going to like sneak it into his drink. Um, we have him like sort of standing and, and taking it from Travis who's pointing at him in this really accusing manner. And he says, I know what you've done and I won't let you do it to grace. You're going to die tonight. And there's no explanation about what the hell that means. When he says, you're not going to do it to grace in the last episode, he said to Anik, we have to save grace. So clearly he believes that something is up. And I have no idea what that could be because Edgar seems so harmless that it's hard to imagine. But this is when Edgar starts calling everybody demons. Um, And he just doesn't seem drunk. There's clearly something else going on here. It's really weird. And so she had been planning to keep him awake, but now it's time to hurry him off to bed because things are very, very bad. Um, we see her like back in their room together. He is laying on his side in the bed and she is putting Roxana in her cage and she climbs into bed after saying something about how he is supposed to carry her over the threshold. He says in response, I'm not a slut. Amazing. I don't know what that even means, but okay. And it turns out she slept in her wedding gown because she couldn't get it off, which I can't imagine. And then he says, I love you to her, but he rolls over and then says, Roxana, he doesn't even say, I love you to her. And he rolls over passed out and it's her wedding night. Like this is devastating. This is awful. I felt for her so bad. I really did. Like I, I mean, it it was just so sad. And yeah, she woke up and found him and that is all she remembers. Oh, and she ran out the door and Travis was like right there, which there's no explanation for. Anika's just sort of like, what was the deal? Why was he there? 
and she has no idea. So uh, at this point, Danner is like, well, maybe she lied about the Adderall. Maybe it wasn't Adderall. Who knows? But because Anik immediately wants to be like, so strike her off as a suspect. And she's like, "Mm, no, actually. So next episode is going to be Travis. And you can tell from the thumbnail, it is going to be a like noir detective. And I cannot wait. I am so excited for this. That is like the genre itself is so ripe for spoof. And he is such a goofball. The combo is bound to be delicious. So I'm extremely excited about it. All right. I have to wrap. Thank you guys again so much for hanging out with me. Thank you to Max for commissioning this. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.